because what you're doing is you're leaving the ordinary world behind you. You're going on this journey that's taking you against the grain of what you've known before. And so we have things that happen in there, like you meet allies, you meet mentors, you meet temptations, things that want to stray, get you straight from the path, um, and you meet villains. <laughs> And at the, when you get to the very, you go through the cycle and when you left the ordinary world behind, you actually cross over into what we call the special world. You have gained all of this wisdom now of, because you've been through something really hard, but now you have this thing, you know, call it whatever you want, you're a little precious, right? Now, what the hero journey means for you to do with that is to take that hard won beautiful thing that you've gained by going through all of this and bring it back out into your community. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Shifting Dimensions podcast. I'm your host, Jumi Moses, and thank you again for tuning into the show. I have the pleasure of speaking with Allison Steger. She is a mythologist, author, speaker, and story shaper who uses her 20 years of experience working with mythology to teach both individuals and organizations how to better understand and shape their own stories. Allison, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's such a pleasure having you on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. I think this is going to be really fun. So. Yeah, it's going to be so fun. I, I just, I love mythologies and I never, I mean, I guess I should have thought about it because it's kind of obvious when you think about it now that, you know, mythologies kind of tell these stories right that have a hidden lesson in them and you know a thousand people can read the same mythology or the same myth and get com completely different things out of it and you know I think those stories and the stories we tell ourselves definitely shape who we are as people mm -hmm. who we are as a society so I want to dive into all of that and also kind of talk about how you know, depending on the story we tell ourselves helps us to kind of shift from one reality to the next, which is something that we're big yeah. on on the show, right? Yeah. But before we get into all of that, I want to talk about what it means to be a mythologist and how you got into mythology. Okay, well, let's see. So I I think that my interest in mythology goes back to my childhood. I had a very, I mean, looking back at it now, I had this kind of interestingly mythic childhood. My dad was a Alaskan bush pilot. And he moved our family to Alaska when I was a year old. And he was like a big adventurer. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Out of Africa, but he, but he saw himself as the Alaska version of the Robert Redford character, like big macho guy, right? And but he was such an amazing storyteller. And the landscape of Alaska is really very mythic. I mean, it's these enormous mountain ranges. I mean, just bigger, larger than life. And these stories that he would tell were really mythic. I mean, he talked about bears and crashing the plane a thousand miles from civilization and, and you know, just crazy stuff all the time. And, you know, so I kind of grew up on a diet of hearing all these stories from him. He's a wonderful storyteller. So you'd love to tell us stories. And then my mom was a big reader and she taught me to read as a child. So I was kind of feeding my appetite for stories through reading a lot of myths and fairy tales as a child and just kind of living in this environment that was where storytelling was such a dominant force, that really got me interested in why the stories were affecting me the way that they were. Uh, so I would read, you know, my parents went through this terrible divorce when I was about five. And the way that I dealt with that was by reading and by, you know, being interested. The stories kind of saved me from my trauma and my grief and my pain. It gave me a place to go where I felt understood and seen, even though I was like doing this, you know, one way interaction with an author. Uh, you know, just to recognize that I could see my own experience in some of these stories that I was reading, especially in a lot of these myths. I mean, they were very big and grand and heavy stories sometimes, like the environment that I was in. And that kind of got me interested without even really understanding why. And then I got a little bit older and I studied lit in college. And then I was also really interested in anthropology and psychology and the study of religions and just spirituality in general. But I didn't really know what to do with all of those things. I was kind of lost as a young adult. Um, I, you know, I was making my way into the world. I didn't, you know, I had a job that I didn't love. And I was, again, like my way of dealing with my life was to read. So I just kept reading all of this stuff. And I, uh, about, gosh, it was almost 25 years ago now, I discovered the work of this guy named Joseph Campbell. And if you think about that, you've heard of The Hero's Journey. It comes out of one of his early books called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It was published in the 40s. And in his work, he was pulling psychology and religion and sociology and literature and all of these things together 
in looking at these old stories and when I found his work, I was just like, that's it. This is it for me, right? This is how, it, like the instinct that I had around stories can help heal our lives. I, I was finding the way to start to think about it then. So then, you know, that led me to other writers because he would talk about Carl Jung's work or, or Kurenyi or, you know, some of these other scholars that I, um, Mircea Eliade is a you know, guy at the University of Chicago that wrote about um, rituals and, you know, shamanism and lots of other really interesting things. So I just, you know, I just had this deep, deep appetite for all of this. So I was just like, read, 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 read. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, a few years later, uh, I found a graduate program that was kind of, um, centered in Carl Jung's work that was this mythological studies PhD program. So I enrolled in that and that was the beginning of my professional career as a mythologist. And as I started working with people, I the more that I learned about how to look at our own lives mythically, the more I could help people figure out how to get unstuck, what their next step on their path was, how to deal with the stories in their past that maybe weren't serving them anymore, you know, looking at our origin stories or as creation myths and kind of mapping out how we interact with the stories of our lives. And the thing about mythology that's so cool is when we talk about looking at a life mythically, you know, I have one of the first things I do with people when I work with them is I, you know, usually they have some particular part of their story that they want to work with, like say their divorce or their relationship with their mom or, you know, whatever. It could be anything that's providing pain or trauma or something that needs to be dealt with and they're coming to me so they can address that well you know we tell the story as they've always told it to their family members or to themselves or whatever but then when you come back around and you start to tell it as if it was a myth what it can do that's really cool is it gives you a sense of distance from your own story so if you say you know you say well this is my story my mom and me but then you go back and you write it as if it was a myth and all of a sudden it's over here right? It's not here in the body. It's not kind of somatically attached to you. <laughs> so what you can do then is you can kind of walk around it a little bit and you can say, okay, well, I never saw before, you know, why my mother did that say, or why she insists on treating me like I'm eight years old. Well, let's, let's try to figure that out a little bit. And, and you can start to get some of those answers and it really gives you this wonderful perspective. And uh, I may be getting ahead of myself here, but I'm going to tell you the second thing that I figured out that turned out to be really important in the work was, you know, I can sit everybody down and I can give a lecture or teach a class or whatever, and we can talk about this myth or that myth or whatever. We can apply it to the whatever part of our lives we're working with. But what I learned a few years ago that was really powerful is we do the myth work and then uh, myth and ritual go together pretty significantly, right? And there's a reason for that. There was a reason that we had a physical thing in the body that we would do that we would that would allow us to become more connected to the world of the sacred, right? And what that's doing is that's engaging our somatic selves in the work. So what we always do now is I will teach and then we do some kind of movement exercise. I have this um, plan that I've developed where we take the poses from yoga and each one of the poses has a symbolic animal or some other kind of symbolism attached to it. And what you can do is you can take all of those symbols, like for example, if you think about the pose downward facing dog in yoga, the dog is, is a, a, an animal that has a lot of symbolism associated with it. And usually the symbolism of the dog is as the psychopomp. So that's the escort into the underworld and into that descent state that we go in. So you can take that and say, okay, now I'm gonna, you can take all of those symbols from all of those poses. And what you do is you map them to the myth so what you're doing is you're learning that you're learning the myth through your ears, and then you're going into the studio and you're pulling the myth into your body and pulling it energetically through your body. And then now all of a sudden <laughs> you're living, you had this embodied myth inside your body because of the energy that, you, that you've now moved through. So, you know, in this yoga is one of the, one of the ways that we do that, but we do a lot of rituals and that's the intention is to say, okay, we can hear things with our ears and we can kind of live in our Athena mind <laughs> up here in the head. But what we also need to do is acknowledge that we are not just carrying our head around, but they were living in this body and we need to pull the story through the body energetically. And once, once I started doing that, which was six or seven years ago, it really did change. Like I can work with someone for two days on a retreat, uh, like a weekend workshop or something. I, I ran into someone the other day and she had done two days with me. She had never met me before. She found our workshops through just a Facebook ad or something. I'd never met her before. She didn't know me and my work at all, but she came out 
And I ran into her three years later and she was still processing the work that we had done in two days. So you now this is not this is not because I'm so amazing at my job. This is because these myths are so powerful that once we start to pull them through, and you know, we don't have rituals like we used to, right? We don't have them in our society. So when you can kind of ritualize this experience, it creates profound change. So that's this is the kind of thing that gets me up every day. This is the kind of thing that you know, all I really want to do is share. This is how you can make your life amazing. This is how you can change it. This is how you can create the life that you want for yourself. It's worked for me. I mean, I had a kind of terrible childhood and I have a good life now. I've used these stories to help me figure out how to do that. And this is what I love to do is help other people do that too. So. Wow. Okay. You said something very know, powerful. A lot. <laughs> you said something very powerful that I think is going to be the title of this episode, which is stories can heal our lives. Wow. Mm -hmm. I had to sit with that. That was very, very powerful. And just hearing everything you're talking about, it sounds like we have stories that we tell ourselves, right? Where our origin stories, where we tell ourselves, this is why I am the way I am. This is why my relationships are that way. Now we can create a new story, but it's not just creating the new story. It's embodying that story. And what you're saying is that sometimes these rituals, whether it's through yoga or something else, kind of helps people move that story from a concept into their body, making it a manifested reality, right? So I, I want to talk about, because I don't want to take for granted that the audience knows what a myth is, right? I think we okay, all have a general understanding of what a myth is, but can you kind of break that down a little bit further? What is a myth and, and what's the anatomy of a myth? Well, we have a lot of old stories that still exist in our culture. And the way that I consider myths, usually they're culture stories. And, um, you know, there are some scholars that believe that the only true myths are creation myths, the ones that talk about the origins of the known universe and the origins of the world or the origins of a culture. Like this, the, you know, the world was created out of an egg or out of a serpent or out of, you know, there was, we have a lot of myths that have, talk about the world being smashed together with the sky and there having to be some kind of origin myth that separates those two things to create space for humans. So, you know, and then we have also things like fables and fairy tales and folklore. And, and those are all a little bit different but what they, and I focus tend to focus on myths, but what they do is they have existed for a really long time. And the reason that they're still here and that they're so powerful is just having kind of gone through the wash of so many generations of humans telling them and hearing them and have making them their own. You have this story that exists in a way that can actually really be applied to any particular aspect of human life, right? So when we think about it, a myth is always going to be a, a metaphor, right? So we need to read and hear these myths metaphorically. So if I talk about, say, the goddess Anna, and I, I work with this particular myth a lot. This is a goddess from Mesopotamia. She goes down into the underworld, meets her death, and then comes back about it again. It's, it's a very common pattern, and we're going to talk about hero's journey and what that means in a little bit. But she goes down and she comes back up. So you have a lot of these kind of circular stories where you start out up here, you go down or away or somewhere different into another dimension, really, and you are changed by that experience and you come back out of it. So if you pull away all the cultural details, you have this pattern in which you separate from your community, you are initiated somehow through this process of really painful and difficult stuff, and you come back out. And what happens on the other side of it is that you are now ready to share what you've learned with the greater community. You are prepared to be an asset and a leader in your community. So this is what makes human life mythic, right? We all go through these moments. We all have moments where we are struggling and where we die to an old version of ourselves and we are reborn into a new version of ourselves. And that every time that happens, and it's happening over and over again in everybody's lives all the time, that is a heroic journey. Uh, now, I want to say something really quickly before we go too much farther about the hero's journey. Uh, I think that this is really important. Uh, Campbell called it the hero's journey and kicked off a 50 years of fighting about what a heroine's journey was. <laughs> and, and what's so interesting about that, to me, I think it's, well, the heroine's journey is this thing. And then we take out, you know, like I, I think that that's kind of missing the point a little bit. So in my work, I talk about the heroic journey. And the reason that I made that slight little language change and why I think it matters is because then it's not an identity. 
It is not, I am this gender or that gender. It is an action that you are choosing to take, okay? And people go through trauma all the time and they don't go on heroic journeys. What we're doing here is we're doing a thing that's gonna take a little bit of courage and is very difficult, but the result that we get out of that on the other end is that now we are in a position to help other people the way that we were helped in the beginning by others. So when we go on these heroic journeys, we are making a choice, right? <laughs> we are um, assuming an action and we're not assuming an identity. So you can have those moments where you're a little bit afraid or whatever, but you're still doing this thing that's a choice that you know involves some kind of that, some of the parts of that heroic archetype. But I like doing it that way, saying heroic instead of just hero or heroine, because it removes some problematic stuff out of that part of the equation. So that's a very good point that you brought up. And I'm thinking about it now that when I hear the term the hero's journey, a lot of times I kind of put a male face to that, right? And we're all human beings. We all kind of go through different cycles in our lives, right? So I like that you, you're you kind of taking out the gender from it because it should be kind of like a neutral thing, right? Because right. it's it's a function of life. It is, it's a function of what it means to be a human being, to go through these cycles, to yeah. die to old versions of ourselves. We're constantly being rebirthed as yeah. people, yeah. right? Exactly. So I think that's important you know, that you- Campbell, Campbell did his work as best as he could given the parameters of when he was born and the body that of he course. was born into. He was a white upper-class Irish American guy. And you know he brought a lot of really cool stuff into the world through his own passages through the hero journey. But I'm not interested in this kind of white male perspective. Right? I really want to like make this broader so that anybody can see themselves in it. Anybody can make the choice or not, depending on where they're at. And I, you know, I want to leave all of that behind. I mean, this is how we push the work forward, right? To say, okay, we don't, you know, we're we're tired of that white male thing, right? Like, like let's move on. Let's make that journey. Like, let, let, let's let everybody see themselves in it. And you know, so that's that's what I'm trying to do as we as we deal with this stuff. So yeah, I appreciate what Campbell did, and I certainly learned a lot from him. And he was one of my mentors. But we have to recognize that that there are things that can be left behind, and that's I think that is part of it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So now I want to talk about the hero's journey a little bit, right? We've kind of mm -hmm. just touched on it over the last couple mm -hmm. of minutes, but I want to dive deeper for the listeners who yeah. are listening. Um, what is the hero's journey and what are the different stages of the hero's okay. journey? Okay. So, uh, so we, again, and you forgive me if I call it the heroic journey after everything I just said, but so heroic journeys are a very, very common form of myth. And there is so common, in fact, that one of the names for the hero journey is the monomyth, the one myth that we see over and over again, right? And it, we see it happening in myths to men, male heroes, heroines, goddesses, you know, there's a lot of different. And the reason that I think that it is such a common pattern is because it really is so common in human life. I, I think the first moment that we go through a hero journey is the moment of our birth. We were in an environment that felt safe and comfortable and that we didn't want to leave. And now all of a sudden we are thrust into a new environment that is completely different. And, you know, some of us handle it better than others, right? Um, you know, some people just, you know, they get stuck. I mean, there are people who get psychologically stuck in the moment of their birth, right? But then the next big moment we have it, um, for most people, I think, is the moment that they go through adolescence, right? So you, you are a child and you are dying to the child version of yourself and you are being reborn into the adult version of yourself. And I've got two teenagers in my house right now, and I can tell you, I've got a lot of teenagers in and out of my life, and it's not really that understood that this is a metaphoric death, right? There are kids that really, really get scared in this moment because they don't understand that this is a metaphoric death. So you have kids that are changing, trying to change their identity in a lot of different ways, trying to find their way onto this new path that they find themselves on. Uh, but, you know, again, even after that, say you manage uh, adolescence all right, we do die to old versions of ourselves and we're reborn into new versions of ourselves all the time. You know, relationships and jobs and uh, all of these things are happening over and over again. And we are called upon to figure out how to manage that. And this is basically what the heroic journey is describing, right? We talk about separation. So you start out in what we call the ordinary world. And this is the place that you've always been before, right? And you are called on an adventure. 
And at that moment where someone comes to you and says, you know, we're, something different is about to happen to you, it could be your spouse asking for a divorce or asking for a separation, or it could be a diagnosis, or it could be so many different things that come up throughout the course of our lives while we're putting you in a new job or, you know, whatever. Um, and we have, we recognize that at this moment, we have uh, an important thing that ha happens, which is what we call the refusal of the call. And you see this in lots and lots of stories, right? So you can look at people that, you know, maybe the refusal is something that only happened inside their own minds for a moment. It's usually like, oh, I don't know about this. I don't really want to do this. This is scary. This is new. This is different. I'd rather stay where I'm comfortable. I'd rather stay in the world that is known. I don't want to do this. And some people refuse to call their entire lives. Some people, it's just a moment inside their own minds, right? So, okay. But eventually the, the heroic journey comes to us all. Right. And then you do, you accept it and you start to go on and you have, so what, when I teach this, say, it's a big circle, right? If you're going to draw it on a, on a whiteboard or something, you would draw a circle. And at the top of the circle, like a clock at 12 o'clock, you would see the ordinary world. And then you start to go down and instead you would go like counterclockwise, right? Because what you're doing is you're leaving the ordinary world behind and you're going on this journey that's taking you against the grain of what you've known before. And so we have things that happen in there, like you meet allies, you meet mentors, you meet temptations, things that want to stray, get you straight from the path, um, and you meet villains. <laughs> and at the when you get to the very, you go through the cycle, and when you've left the ordinary world behind, you actually cross over into what we call the special world. Now, in this, this shows up in a lot of different ways. You have the underworld, the world of the dead, the world of the fairies, the, you know, just, I mean, and I, this is one of the things I love about mythology so much. Um, my husband is a really a scientist. Uh, he's a graduate of Caltech. He's a very skeptical kind of guy. And we talk a lot about physics and the ways in which the math is now starting to catch up to all of these old myths. <laughs> Because we have this uh, many worlds theory now in physics, right? And that is has been captured in mythology for 10,000 years. The idea that there is another world on the other side of a very thin curtain from where we are. And it is possible in the myths and in life to access that in different ways. And I talk about this in my work a lot. We do this with creativity. Like, how do you pull some of that energy over? Or how do you, like, try, you know, maybe journey into that yourself? Like, this happens in human life all the time. And, but we don't like talk about it really, like we mythologize it, right? We try to keep it, because it's a little bit scary, right? We keep it a little bit separate from ourselves. So anyway, so now you've gone into this special world and you're having all of these adventures and it's scary and you're changing as you go through this. And then you get down to the bottom say, and you have this confrontation with some kind of a monster or a dragon or whatever. And there's something interesting that happens down here. Um, and we have this other moment where we call it the refusal of the return. So we have the kind of matching moment of the refusal. And what happens down there is you understand how to live in this new place now. And this is this is where I talk to people who are really struggling with letting go of their divorce or letting go of their, you know, maybe you've been given the all clear in your cancer diagnosis, but you're really, you, you're comfortable in the role of the patient and it's not, you're having a hard time getting back to your regular life. This is what we call the refusal of the return. And what can happen here in that moment is, I say you've defeated the dragon, and again, metaphorical dragon, right? You have gained all of this wisdom now of, because you've been through something really hard, but now you have this thing, you know, call it whatever you want, you're a little precious, right? Now, what the hero journey means for you to do with that is to take that hard won beautiful thing that you've gained by going through all of this and bring it back out into your community. I mean, what I love to talk about here is that these myths are gifts from our ancestors. They, they are people that lived before us and they struggled with life in a lot of the same ways that we do. And they did this really wonderful thing is they said, you know what? We figured this thing out and it worked and it was amazing. And we're gonna tell you a great story or this didn't work, don't do that. <laughs> But, but they wrapped it all up in this beautiful package of, okay, here's a cool story. It's got romance and battles and jokes and all these great things, right? Like, oh, look at this present we're going to give you because we love you so much and we want to help you. You know, and anyone that has like the world's sweetest grandmother or, you know, just people that love them in their lives that came before understands what this feels like, right? We're going to give you a thing that's going to transmute across time 
And it's going to help you figure out the same thing that we had to figure out. But the other side of the equation of that is you're going to come out the other side of it and you are now in that position to help somebody else. And that is the whole point. You were helped by allies and mentors and all these people helping you figure out how to do this. And then you come out and you're going to meet somebody and I guarantee you will, somebody else that is about to go through what you just went through and they need your help. They need you to be a mentor. They need you to be a leader. They need you to be their ally. And this is going on all of the time. And what I like to do in this work is say, okay, let us not just survive the hardest things that we go through in life. Does not, that not feel motivating <laughs> to be able to say, you know what? Everything I went through wasn't in vain. Everything I went through can help somebody else now. And the problem is, is if you decide that you don't want to do that, that you don't want to step up and continue and finish the journey and bring that treasure back out to everybody else that needs it, is you kind of turn into the dragon yourself. And now you're sitting on the hoard down there in the bottom, right? And you're turning into the monster that you just had to defeat. Right, okay, I just said a lot of stuff. So maybe we should, I should like let you, you know, I, I was taking notes. I was taking notes, right? Like you were saying so much and I was, you know, keeping mental notes because obviously I want to follow up on a couple of things that you said. But mm -hmm. I was like, this is so good. I need to take notes because I cannot forget <laughs> the points I want to hit, right? Because- well, I, mean, I mean, anything and I will, I will repeat anything you want to, so. Of course, yeah. no, that, that, first of all, that was a very good explanation eating it up also kind of simultaneously reflecting on my life and quote unquote mm -hmm. my hero hero yeah. heroine journey whatever you want to call yeah. it but yeah. uh, okay there's okay so I want to start off with the very end right which yeah. I think is so important I, and I've always kind of had this knowing right where a lot of the things we go to go through they're for us and for our learning and for our evolution mm -hmm. but a large chunk of it is for others, right? Because we are all connected. We all yeah. need each other, right? So it's kind of like whatever you go through, I don't want to, you know, I think you kind of alluded to it, alluded to this, but it's it's kind of important to share the gems that you picked up along mm -hmm. the way, the things that you've learned, right? Whether you're sharing mm -hmm. it with one more person who might be going through something similar to you or the masses, right? And you, that's why I think you see a lot of people who go through a lot of traumatic things end up writing a book or sharing their story to help someone yeah. else who can who might find themselves in that situation. So that was very very important for me to highlight. Okay, so I kind of want to take a step back a little bit, right? Cuz yeah, you, you okay. mentioned a couple of things which I find very fascinating. So I'm going to talk about them in order, not too much. I think three points here. So the first yeah. one you talked about was the whole idea of being called and kind of being like, no, I don't want to do this, right? Because a lot of times when we're called to do something, when we're called to take that adventure, which I was very fascinated by the fact that you called it an adventure, because a lot of people wouldn't see it as an adventure, right? Whether you lose a job, you're going through a breakup, you lost a family member, your whole world feels like it's crumbling. Mm -hmm. But I think you using that word adventure kind of like flipped something in my brain, because if you really think about it, it's an adventure you're stepping into a new reality that you're not used to that in and of itself is an adventure right so yeah. but the thing that you talked about was like this idea of like once you start going down that path you're met met with mentors friends but temptations right I kind of want to talk about the temptations piece mm -hmm. a little bit because I found that very interesting uh, what are the temptations exactly that you're that okay people well, are facing? let me I, I just want to back up because I want to tell you a fun little story about that word adventure okay um so so I was uh, involved with the Joseph Campbell Foundation for many years Campbell did not have children. He left all of his intellectual property to the Joseph Campbell Foundation. And they, they were, you know, they were my good friends when I was getting started with this work. And the guy that was running it for decades was a guy named Robert Walter. He was Campbell's last editor at the end of his life. And he became a good friend of mine. And I was talking to him. He's since moved to Mexico. But I was talking to him a, a few months ago. And we were having a conversation about all this just via Zoom. And he said, you know, Campbell wanted to call it the adventure. We got this phrase, the hero's journey, and it became the thing that stuck. But Campbell felt like that was too onerous, too serious, almost like too heavy in a way. Like, like let's talk about it like an adventure because did you not feel the shift in the energy of that story when you changed words from journey, like this hard, hard thing they must do? When you just change that one word, now it's got a different feel to it. And this is really at the core of all of this work. Like, how can we... Sometimes a myth, all it takes is one word out of a myth to completely shift something. 
you know, and I do this all the time. Like you can look at giant myths like the entire culture, but sometimes all you need is one line from a myth or even one word from a myth. And like one of my favorite examples is like, I, I mentioned this goddess Inanna. And the, the first line of that myth, Inanna in the descent, is Inanna turned her ear to the great below. So you imagine this kind of turning. And and but also what is interesting is if you look at the cuneiform language, the written language of Mesopotamia at that time, the word ear and the word wisdom were the same character. So she is finding this wisdom. She's turning her ear toward this place of of change and transformation. So just that's just one example. You can do this with any myth, right? Like you can, if you look at it and you sit with it and you meditate with it and you kind of pull the myth into your body, it starts to reveal itself in ways that are specific to you, right? It will show up for you in the way that you need it. And that's a big part of what I like to do too, is I don't want to like say, well, these are all the myths that are personally relevant and pointing for me. I want to teach people how to find whatever myth it is that they need. It could be the myth from you know the culture of your family, or maybe not. Maybe it's a different part of the world entirely. And you're particularly resonating with this other place, and that's okay too. Like all of these stories come from all of our ancestors, right? So you don't have to confine yourself to that. So I wanted to myth. just really add to what you just said about oh, yeah. you know that word adventure kind of shifting yeah. the the energy of the understanding of the hero journey, right? Like it's this serious thing. It's a journey you have to go on. A lot of times when you think about journey, you think about kind of like going uphill. It's not easy, mm -hmm. right? It's Art. rewarding, but it's not always easy. But the adventure piece, like what switched in my mind, the energy shift was kind of like, oh, I'm curious now. Like there was a sense of curiosity mm -hmm. and intrigue right because when you're curious about something when you're intrigued by something you're like oh I want to know more I want to see what I can learn here this is unfamiliar unfam territory but I'm mm -hmm. curious to kind of see where this leads how this unfolds right and that's what kind of like shift from shifted for me so I wanted to kind of add to that point uh, that you made um yeah. but yeah the temptations that we were talking the temptation. about okay so um so this is a little part of the original um hero with the thousand faces book Campbell included the woman as temptress, which he got a lot of grief for because it was so gendered, right? Women as this object that are beautiful and can cause the male hero to leave the path that he's on. Now, so there are a lot of people that leave it out of the, the steps of the hero. I mean, you can find a million different versions of the hero's journey on the internet and people leave that out because it is a little bit problematic in that sense. But again, like I like to back it up, like what is this telling us about the psychology of this? And it, it, I mean, maybe for you it's a woman, usually it's not though, right? It can be anything, like if you are, okay, anything that's going to keep you from going through the steps that you need to get through and pulling that treasure and bringing it back, that is your, that's your journey, right? So you have to like recognize when, you know, and, and this is where working with this stuff takes a lot of intuition. It takes a lot of um, really conversations with yourself and your own unconscious mind, because sometimes, sometimes we need to rest, right? Sometimes we need to stop and recognizing the difference between being stuck and needing to rest is something that takes a little bit of nuance, right? You can't just slam your way through these, these parts of your life. Sometimes people want to get it over with the hard thing that they have to go through. Right. Um, but you know, say if you close the book on your divorce and it's over, but you're still dealing with it 20 years later, you are stuck, <laughs> right? So, so, so what is it? I, I think that when we talk about the temptation, all what I, all I'm really saying is recognize when you need to be getting to work on this and when you are being tempted, and and it takes real psychological work to figure that out, right? And and I I know this too. Like I we're all in heroic journeys all the time. And we are all showing up in everybody else's heroic journeys all the time. You know, let's think for a minute about who you might be the temptation for, who I might be the temptation for, or who you might be the villain for, or who you're the ally for. Like recognizing that everybody is on their own heroic journeys all the time and the, the role that you're going to play for them is going to impact how they interact with you, right? And we're going to talk about archetypes a little bit later, but I think that archetypes and the role that archetypes play has a big part of this, right? Like if you are having a real problem with someone at work and it's just constant conflict with them if you have anybody that you're in constant conflict with 
Think about how you might be showing up as a villain in their myth, right? Because <laughs> that's definitely happening. But, and, but what that does, though, it does the same thing. Like, I, you know, I use that little word adventure, and that shifted something for you. And it's going to create the same kind of shift for you to when you start to get used to doing this work and to looking at your life meta, uh, as a myth, then and metaphorically, you know, in all those ways, it gives you a way to walk around it, as I said before. So, you know, if you're going to Thanksgiving dinner next week and you're always in conflict with your mom, well, let's walk around the story a little bit and understand. I mean, maybe she treats you like she's eight because that was the happiest time of her life and she really wishes that it was not gone. And she wishes she was that person that she was when you were eight. And she has no idea that she's doing that, <laughs> right? But if you can do that, if you can recognize what it is that she's getting out of this thing that's so frustrating for you, it allows you some compassion and empathy for where she is. And it allows you to have a conversation that's not so loaded with emotion and energy, right? Once you find that place of compassion that you can bring to that conversation, it really does change things. And you start to have a breakthrough. Like for every single person that is in a family where there's different political opinions coming out of this election, Try that. <laughs> try walking around the outside of it a little bit. Try to understand why your family member voted for the other side. See what it is that they're getting out of it. And it may be that they're getting something terrible out of it, you know, but it helps you understand them, right? Like, what is it? What is it that they're gaining from this? What is it about the archetype that that politician was holding that resonated for them and makes the world make sense to them? So, you know, these conversations, like not understanding each other is a big impediment to us figuring out how to communicate. And this just kind of gives us another way to look about it. It gives us a shift in our perspective. So. so what I'm hearing you say is that the temptation is not literally like someone dangling, uh, I don't know, candy in front of your face and telling you to eat it when you're tr not trying to eat it. I mean, that's such a simple analogy. Yeah. But what I'm hearing is that the temptation is more of kind of realizing when you're moving forward in your journey versus getting stuck right like being able to recognize whether you need rest in order for you to keep moving forward or whether you are actually kind of falling back into old patterns that kind of keep you stuck without you being realizing that so that's where like the temptation comes into play which I also think ties into something else that you said towards the end of your explanation of the hero's journey towards the end of the cycle right where you say that so you you accept the invitation to go on this journey you're on this journey you're meeting these different people your helpers the villains in your story etc mm -hmm. and then you are kind of transported into this other dimension quote unquote this other world right yeah. and in that other world you face this creature this monster mm -hmm. and my understanding of the monster was kind of like you being confronted, I feel like, with the ultimate test, which is, do you, and let me know if I'm wrong, which is going back to that old version of yourself, right? Because now you're almost at the end. You're, you've almost completed that cycle. You're now actually shifting into this new reality, this new story that you're supposed to be in. And this monster is kind of like the, basically trying to pull you back into yeah where you were just coming from. Is that correct? Is that, uh, is that a fa uh, so fair let understanding? Let me share, you, share a little story with you. I don't, I don't know if you are, are a Star Wars fan, but uh, George Lucas, when he was writing the original Star Wars movie, he was really struggling with the script and he got a hold of Hero with a Thousand Faces and that helped him develop the storyline. And what we see happening, and this is straight out of, out of the hero's journey, right? He, in, in the Empire Strikes Back movie, Luke goes into this cave and he has a lights and he, Yoda says, don't take your weapon in there. And he does anyway. And he goes in and he confronts Darth Vader in the cave and he has a battle with him and cuts off his head. And when he lifts up the visor, it's his own face. Right. So yes, that's exactly what you're talking about. Right. He, what you're, the thing that you're fighting against in that moment is in fact yourself. And, and I do this when I do, um, retreats, I will set up, I, I, I like working with the myth of the Minotaur. So what we do is I set up a candle labyrinth at, at night and we lay, lay out the entire labyrinth in flames and candles and walk the labyrinth. And then what happens is in the center, you are in fact having a dialogue with that Minotaur, that monster, that dragon or whatever. And it's always a part of yourself, right? So that is the version of yourself that you're leaving behind. That is the moment of the metaphoric death right, where you're now a different person and you're going up into that place that you're ready to come back out. And it's not the end of the journey by any means, it's the six o'clock, right? <laughs> it's the bottom. 
And then your part of your journey is you're going to keep coming back out of that and you're going to face a lot more obstacles along the way and you have to escape and you have to do all these things. But that is it. Like you've got, you've really nailed it right there. Good job. <laughs> so yes, it is, it is your own face that, you know, and you can stay there and you can say, I, don't, I really don't want to finish this. I don't want to change. You are tempted to be that dragon and sitting on the horde of everything that you've learned. And that's a very easy place for people to get stuck. Thank you for breaking that down. And I, I think part of the reason why I, I got that part of what you were just describing about the hero's journey and the cycle of it is because recently, and I, I always find it very interesting because there are certain things that I'll be contending with in my life, nothing too crazy, but then I'll interview people or, you know, sit down and, you know, do the Shifting Dimensions podcast. And I feel like the conversation I have is in direct correlation <laughs> with some of the questions I've been like mauling over, right? Where, yeah. you know, I recently had a situation where someone very close to me in my life kind of called me out of the blue and basically kind of gave me advice to kind of reconsider a situation that I no longer wanted to consider. And mm -hmm. I thought, huh, is this a sign to reconsider that situation or is this a sign for me to double down is is this a test right you know like so it's it's I mean I'm, I guess I'm still trying to figure that out but this offers more clarity right it's kind of like that part in your story where you feel yourself like oh, okay I'm coming I'm fully embodying who this next version of myself and then all of a sudden there's this like test or doubt that comes into your mind where whether it's the universe or or God, however you want to say it, where it's like, are you sure? You know what I mean? Like it's, are you sure you want to go to the next step or are, do you want to like, you, you might be more comfortable right here, or it might even be the old version of yourself kind of manifesting itself and doing that. So I, I, I found that very fascinating. Okay. So yeah, now I, I want to go. Sorry. I was just going to say that, you know, there are, when you have those kind of questions and you do have them a lot when you're going on these journeys, there are ways to figure out the answers. You have the answers. And accessing the part of yourself that knows <laughs> is, you know, something that that you that we have the tools to to get you through that, right? So so you can in fact get the answer. Your unconscious mind knows what the answer is, and you know that's often what I do when I work like with coaching, like I, at coaching clients, and they're struggling with those exact kind of questions. So you know, again, I'm I'm not their guru or whatever. This is not about me trying to say this is who I am. I'm like, you're going to do the work. <laughs> you have to do the work. You're the only one that can do the work. And I think that when people like say they're gurus or whatever, it's dangerous because what you're saying is I'm going to take on the work that you have to do and do it for you, and that is a false thing. That is not possible. But it's it's really really comforting to think that you might not have to do it yourself, right? So you know when someone's say, you know trying to take that from you, they're they're gonna use that against you sometimes. And you have to be really careful because this work is not really escapable. You can hide from it. You can spend your whole life doing that, but eventually you're gonna have to rise or you will die. <laughs> so mm. yeah, those two choices, right? Yeah, or or live an unfulfilling life. And God knows, right, right, exactly, right. yeah, I, I've which is like it's away. the metaphor again, right? Like you're stuck. Yeah, stuck in of course. So. Of course, Lord knows I've, I've tried to run away from the hard work. Like it's, of course, it's easy right? to have someone say, this is what you should do. Right. But, you know, to your point about, we kind of know the answers our conscious mind does. So do we find the answers? Do we unearth the, the answers through meditation or do we just give it time for it to kind of float up to the surface? Right. Because we're not well, literally. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. you can get, get there. There are doing things like meditation, um, doing movement, like I talked about here, like those are all things that can help you get through. And I, I do offer some things, you know, that you can uh, work on. Like if you want to go to my website, I can help you help you figure some of that out too. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really it, right? Like you are there, like this is what dream work is, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you start to embrace dream work, your dreams will tell you. And in fact, I find it really, really helpful when I'm considering a question to pay a lot of attention to the few moments be before I fall asleep and when I've just woken up, because that's when the barrier between the worlds is very thin and insights will come in. Like if you put something into your mind and you ask for an answer, you will often get it by the time you've woken up. And it's a very simple thing that anybody can do, right? And yeah, so just, you know, if, if you have something that you wanna know, ask yourself and your unconscious mind will often tell you, <laughs> yeah. but you have to also have to be willing for it to not be the answer that you want. 
Right. Cause that's yeah. sometimes that happens. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's kind of the issue. Um, I, I think what you just said was very important, especially with dream work. I also ask through prayer, right? Like, can you okay. give me clarity? And sometimes I, I want it to be so this is what you should do. And sometimes yeah. like we keep getting the same answer, but like, I, at least let me speak for myself. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, but it's not loud enough. It feels like a whisper, like make it louder. So I know for sure, like you're, you know, this is well, what I'm supposed it, to do. I think that eventually it will get louder and gets louder and louder and louder. I mean, this, this happened to me, actually, I was struggling with being stuck myself. This was um, yeah, seven or eight years ago. I was not really working much. I was afraid to share my ideas with the world. I really was stuck and I was becoming the dragon that was hoarding. And I started having problems here at this chakra because my voice was not coming out. I was not sharing the thing that I needed to share. I literally got cancer. <laughs> and I'm not suggesting that people get cancer in ways that it's not a punishment or anything. It's not that. It was this part of my body that was trying to get my attention. And it just kept getting louder and louder and louder and louder. And finally, I was like, okay, you know, it's time to stop be hoarding that treasure, right? It's time to start sharing the work with the world. And that was a huge wake up call for me to say, okay, how many throat problems do I have to have? How many times do I, am I going to get bronchitis and strep throat and one illness after another that is sitting in this exact part of the body, <laughs> right at the chakra? Like this was where the big knots were for me, so... That's such a powerful story that you shared. And I think I, something similar used to happen to me a couple, you know, years ago where I would always have strep throat, always had strep throat. My lymph nodes were always kind of like swollen a bit. And I think, you know, I think that was a function of me not speaking my truth and, and Thank you. Yes, exactly. saying what I, I want, exactly. my desires and kind of living mm -hmm. in my authentic power. Right. And it, it, again, it was really connected to the throat chakra like the throat and just being able to speak and voice out what I wanted what I didn't want and just really express myself in a way that was truthful and aligned to me and I I can I mean yeah I don't remember the last time knock on wood <laughs> I've had strep throat so okay right. I mean I, once I figured that out all the throat problems went away once I started actually doing the thing that I needed to be doing the whole time yep. it all just stopped right mm -hmm. so yeah. And the, the lesson here, listeners, and I think we've I kind of had this lesson talked about throughout <laughs> different shows is that you don't want it to get too loud before you start listening right. to those whispers or those yeah. nudges to, you know, move forward in the way that you're supposed to move forward. OK, so now I kind of want to pivot a little bit or kind of, you know, I think this ties into everything that we've been talking about. I want to talk about archetypes, right, because that's something that you're very big on. And in the hero journey, do do we each adopt a specific archetype? Or is the or is the hero the archetype itself? Well, okay. If we if you don't mind, I'd like to back up just a little. I want to make sure we of define course. what an archetype is. I don't know that maybe all of your listeners know what that is. No, <laughs> please yeah. define it. Yes, that's a good yeah, call. Yeah. So so I mean I, I do think so an archetype is basically um any type of way of being human, right? So if you think about just about any noun that's associated with a human activity, you know, we talk a lot about the mother archetype or the child archetype or you know, whatever. Um uh, any anything that's a noun that is associated with people can can be, in fact, a type of archetypal space. So what this is doing is we are recognizing that there is an amount of energy that has kind of accrued around certain types of human behavior. So everybody knows what a mother is. Now, maybe you had a good mother, maybe you had a bad mother, you know, whatever your experiences were, everybody knows that that's a part of human life that's separate from um, you know, a, a ditch digger or whatever, you know, like any anything really. And so we have to kind of account for how archetypal energy is influencing us. And, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are um, working with astrology, working with tarot cards, whatever. And, and to me, what that's doing is that is capturing a snapshot of what is happening with the movement and energy in life. And archetypes are doing that too, right? So, so when I work with my clients, I work with understanding what archetypes might be influencing them in the past, in the present, and in the future. We can al always get a really good read on what's coming through this. But what I also recognize is that archetypes are shifting, and as culture shifts, which it does at every moment, new archetypal energies are going to spring up. Now, I believe that Donald Trump holds an enormous amount of archetypal energy for our culture because, I mean, whether you hate him or love him, he is holding a type of energy that is cooling up around that for some reason. I, and my personal opinion about Trump is that he holds a lot of trickster energy. 
fixtures exist to go in and break up calcified forms of power. And what he's doing and what's appealing about him to the people that like him is that the government and the way that it has been was really stuck in the way that it was. And he is breaking that up with a sledgehammer. Now you have, you can have issues when you put the, usually the trickster operates around the edges of things and that's the place for, for them that has the most power. I think it's really interesting that he could not get elected from the presidency, right? <laughs> he had to leave and then come back. Uh, but yeah, so he's he's taking a sledgehammer to some of those things that were not working for people. And you can think that's a bad thing or you can think that's a good thing, but it's a lot of archetypal energy. And I see that a lot with, I mean, the bigger a celebrity is, the more archetypal energy that they're holding. I, I went to a, a show with my son at this Taylor Swift concert last year. And to, in my mind, she's holding a lot of energy like Artemis. She's protecting young girls. And this is a space where a lot of women are feeling a lot of joy being together. And, you know, she's performing and it's fine. I mean, whatever you think of her music, but the power of that show was in the crowd, right? It was about the way that people were experiencing the sacred in that moment because of the way they're communicating through her music, right? Now that's happening for big celebrities, but it's also happening for us in our lives day to day. Every single person is holding archetypal space for other people. And the way that I see it, if you are getting a reaction out of someone that you don't understand why they're reacting that way, it could be a positive or a negative. Someone's trolling you on the internet, you are probably holding archetypal space for them. They are reacting to you as if you are in fact an archetype, right? <clears throat> Same thing with the positive. If, you're, if someone's like, oh my God, I think you're the most amazing. You're like, you don't even know me. <laughs> Well, you know what? They're probably reacting to an archetype. There is something about the constellation of archetypal energy that you are holding that is triggering something in them psychologically. So we are dealing with this with each other all the time, right? You go home and your mom, you know, again, that eight-year-old kid that she's seeing, she is, you are holding the child archetype for her. And she does not see the flawed and changeable person that you are on the inside. She sees the little kid because that's what she wants to see, right? And, and so once we start to recognize this, like it helped me a lot as a parent when my kids started to become teenagers to recognize when they saw me, the human, flawed human being that I am, and when they saw the mother archetype. And there are times that my kid gets upset with me and I'm like, you don't even see me right now. All you're doing is you are trying to separate yourself psychologically from your family of origin as you're about to go to college. You, are, you need that mother archetype to push against. And once I realized that, that was something that I needed to let happen and not get my feelings hurt because there was, you know, they talked about soiling the nest with teenagers, right? Like you're going to mess it up because you need to separate yourself, right? So if you can say, okay, I, I recognize that this big energetic shell and armor is like sitting around me right now. It, it really does. It, it pulls away your own ego from the situation. If you can recognize that you're holding an archetype for someone, it's not really about you anymore, right? Which can be enormously freeing. For one thing, it gives you some compassion for who you're talking to. It gives you a sense of humor about it. And sometimes you you can say, well, you know what? No, this is not like, so I, I talk to women sometimes, they're like, he keeps treating me like an, on his mother. Well, you know, you're not gonna be that archetype for him, right? That's not what you're gonna allow and you need to put a stop to that. So sometimes you can recognize that the person needs that from you. Sometimes you can be okay with that or you could not but it's gonna create a new avenue of negotiation in your relationship. And it really does help depersonalize some of the interactions we have with other human beings because you recognize that it's not really about you at all. For whatever reason, you are holding something and they don't even see you, right? And I think that the reason that this happens is because really seeing people takes an enormous amount of energy and we're not always willing to invest it, right? So if you would rather, you're just gonna like, I'm gonna, respond to you based on the most basic things I can figure out about the way that you look or the way that you speak, then I don't have to go to the work of actually seeing a fellow flawed human being in front of me. But that's when relationships really start to happen, right? <laughs> when you see that person that's on the inside. So if you recognize that, then it becomes a little bit less personal, right? Like, okay, they are not reacting to me. They don't know me. I am not being seen in this situation. This is what's happening. They are bouncing off of some big energetic thing of energy that's like accrued around my body and that's what's really happening here. So. That's, you know, I've never thought about that. I've never thought about any of this, to be quite honest. I've just recently started getting into this notion of archetypes. And I know that we shift from archetype to archetype as we go through life. I think most people have a dominant archetype um, that they go through. And I think, you know, like most things in life, there there's the more positive side of an archetype versus the more negative side. 
of, oh yeah they all know, have light and shadow are, aspects yeah like sure. all all archetypes tend to have a shadow aspect most of them right um mm -hmm. so but I've never thought about the idea that a lot of times when we're interacting with people they're interacting with us through the archetypes that we're presenting or the archetypes that they perceive us to be presenting right so mm -hmm. which also informs their reaction to mm -hmm. us and I think the example that you gave with the mother child dynamic mm -hmm makes a lot of sense and I think also what you know when we think about this whole discourse about dating and like women are so difficult men are so difficult both sides think the other side is a certain type of way so some individuals a lot of individuals from a different gender interacting with the opposite gender tends to put whichever gender in an archetype mode yeah. when they're interacting with them right yeah. which in turns kind of perpetuates certain narratives and certain stories that we yes. tell ourselves on an individual and a collective level, which that makes a lot of sense. Okay. That mm -hmm. was really, really good. So again, just kind of doubling down the archetypes. When we go on our hero journey, are we adopting a certain archetype? Is the hero the archetype itself? And then we're shifting from the past archetype. Like, so let's say I, what are the different archetypes? So let's say somebody was a trickster archetype before and then they're invited to go on this adventure, right? And mm -hmm. they adopt the hero archetype to go through that adventure. But on the other side, are they still coming out as the trickster archetype or are they typically changing into a completely different archetype? I don't know if that well, question I mean, makes can, sense. You can hold more than one, right? I mean, okay. it, it does happen. You, you do hold, I mean, the hero and the heroine, that is, that is an archetype. And what I think can be really useful about it is that you can take on the archetypal energy on purpose, right? If you are saying, okay, I know that I need to step up into this heroic role, if you use your meditation time or you use your prayer time to kind of pull that onto yourself, it really will help you navigate that moment. Now, if you have, if that trickster archetype is one that really speaks to you and always has, you always want to be like trying to break things up or make jokes that are going to make people a little bit uncomfortable and try to implement change through the way that you're, you know, this is a lot of what the trickster is doing, right? It's, it's funny. It's vulgar. It's venal, <laughs> and it is something that breaks up things that are calcified, right? So, you know, that can be a, a, an archetype that's really strong for you. And, you know, there are ways that you can kind of figure out which archetypes you resonate with. There are decks that you can buy that are kind of like tarot decks. You can find them on Amazon or whatever. You know, just find an archetype deck and, and just start to look at them. And there are ones that tell you this is the light aspect of this archetype. This is the shadow aspect of this archetype. And there are light and shadow aspects to all of them. I mean, you can be, I mean, it can be the most villainous one you can think of, but there are ways in which the light aspect of that is going to help you on the path, right? So it does, it, it can be really helpful because you can say, I am going to pull this toward myself. I'm going to borrow this big, massive amount of energy that exists archetypally, and it's going to help me cover up and protect my fragile human self that's on the inside. And, um, Sorry. <laughs> and it's going to allow me to navigate this journey. So when we talk about the heroic journey, you really do need to borrow the energy of that heroic archetype in order to do all these big, scary things you have to do, right? When you're dealing with a, a cancer diagnosis or something or a divorce, I mean, dying and being reborn is freaking scary, right? <laughs> and it's something that we have to do. And it's something that we really don't want to do. And we're going to push it away as hard as we can. Um, so, you know, if we can, whatever we can do, whatever tools we can pick up that are going to help us navigate that moment are absolutely there for us. And this is what these myths and archetypes have to offer. So yes, you can be a trickster hero, right? And what you may be doing is you may be creating some new constellation of this energy. So that may, I mean, I, I think that what some of our celebrities are doing is in fact creating new archetypes, like. Taylor Swift, if I say she's like Artemis, she is like Artemis in some ways because she's protecting young girls, but she's also something entirely new. It has capitalism in it and it has, you know, a lot of different threads in it. You know, the way that Donald Trump is being a trickster is not the same as Coyote in, in Navajo mythology, right? I mean, that's a different need for a different culture, but it's accomplishing the same thing, right? So yeah, you are going to pull a lot of different archetypes at any given time. And, and I find I do this all the time, right? Like I'll get on my archetype deck and I'll see what energetically is presenting itself to me in that day. Like, what is it like the way that people pull a tarot card just for their morning? Like I've done this all the time, right? Like, okay, what is this saying to me this morning? Give you something to meditate on 
it gives you um, a path to kind of consider. Uh, but yeah, so so yes, you are going to be using these all the time. You can't really do it without it. Anyway, so does that kind of answer your question? Like you are holding different archetypes and you're going to need all the thing of them as like arrows in your quiver or whatever. These are all their own kind of allies, right? They are, these archetypes are showing up for you as allies. I mean, it's not just people that are allies, right? It can be a book. It can be a piece of art. It can be just a thought that you have in your mind. It can be something that inspires you and gives you the courage to take the next step. No, that makes perfect sense. And I do believe that we definitely hold more than one archetypes. And I am going to take a deep dive into the different mm -hmm. types of archetypes. How many are there typically defined? I know that probably, like you said, new ones are being created pretty yeah. often. I don't know pretty often, but new ones are being created. But what are, are there like standard archetypes, kind of like how we have in astrology oh. where we have like the 12 signs or they're like 12 yeah. main archetypes? Well, I, I do, yeah, I mean, yes, there are plenty of people out there that have been working with this stuff for years that have defined a kind of discrete set of archetypes, you know, say a few hundred or whatever. And, and that's a really useful place to get started with this work, to buy one of these archetype decks and just say, okay, well, I'm going to pull, okay, so you can talk about kings and queens and, and hermits and nuns and, and you know, like, um, I don't know, advocates. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways that, you know, so I was being very general when I started this, because I said that it can be any noun that describes human behavior, because it can be like, what's the archetype of a ditch digger? Well, <laughs> okay, it's not the same as, you know, a king or whatever, like it's holding something that's different about human experience. And all of that has generated a certain amount of power around it. So when we look at big people in our culture, that have a lot of attention on them, positive and negative, they are pulling little pieces of all of these different archetypal energies and that's being woven into something new, right? So what Donald Trump is doing is again, not the same, it's different, but it's got some of those hallmarks, right? He's got venality, he's got, he's vulgar sometimes, right? He's very funny to the people that find it funny, right? Like it's, these are things that are coming that pull from that and the power of that gets created through how all of that constellates into one form and it's something new, so. Uh, yeah, so I would say that, you know, for anybody that's starting out with this work, one of the best things I can advise is just to buy an archetype deck and start to ask it questions, right? Start to pull cards and see what it is that's presenting itself. And if you get something that feels a little bit uncomfortable, that's actually a really good thing because it's sparking something. There's some energy associated with that for you. So if you get, you know, if you get, if you get the trickster and you don't feel yourself as a trickster, well, maybe it's time to invite some of that trickster energy into your own life. Maybe there are things in your life that need to be broken up through humor and through a non-traditional approach to the problem. It's telling you something from your unconscious mind about what needs to happen next. And again, it's really subtle and it's just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So. You know, what you said about being able to kind of intentionally step into um, an archetype makes a lot of sense, right? granted you know I've been kind of getting more curious about this whole notion of archetypes recently just even in having conversation with my sister or friend sometimes like mm -hmm. I'll create certain archetypes to def like yeah. kind of categorize people or certain situations right so I've been kind of having fun with that so the fact that this is coming up in this conversation means I probably need to look into it a lot deeper but even with the limited knowledge I have I have had moments where when I'm rewriting my story, rewriting a myth, rewriting a narrative that I'm tired of giving my power to, I mm -hmm. genuinely feel an energetic shift, a, a, a sense of stepping into a new archetype, right? And I think one of the more popular um, discussions that keep coming up, especially in the metaphysical and spiritual circles, is this idea of leaving victim consciousness right like not being mm -hmm. a victim to your life kind of stepping into a place of personal power which I consider that an energetic shift yeah. that's a stepping into a different archetype so that's just one example but I do feel myself every single time I switch my story where I'm like okay I'm tired of looking at life through this lens I'm tired of attracting these same things to me and mm -hmm. when I pray about it, meditate on it, and I feel like, okay, enough is enough. Like, I can genuinely feel myself being like, okay, I'm going to put on a different armor and I'm going to become this archetype because this archetype um, fits better into the new story that I want to tell. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about the victim archetype for a minute. I do think yeah. it's a really important one. And and I, I appreciate what you're saying about that. 
And, and this, this is one that does come up a lot. And in fact, there is another scholar, her name is Carolyn Mason. She's written about archetypes in the past and she does in fact have an archetype um, deck of her own. And she talks about that as one of the foundational archetypes because we all feel a sense of vulnerability that allows that victim energy to come in. And the way that I like to work with this particular archetype is to recognize what it is that we're gaining from holding the constellation of that victim archetype. If we can recognize what our need was from that archetype, then we can show gratitude to what it's given us already and, and release it. Okay, so then what you're doing, you're framing your story differently, right? You're saying, okay, this is a thing that I needed to survive. I needed to do that. And there, you can see, I mean, I'm not to harp on Donald Trump too much, but the guy loves to claim to be a victim, right? And why is he doing that? He's the most powerful person, one of the most powerful people in the world. Why is he doing that? Because there's so much power in the victim archetype, because what we're talking about is abject vulnerability. And that place of true vulnerability can be incredibly powerful. So, okay, now we recognize that that, that vulnerability was needed and was maybe, maybe it served us in some way that we don't fully understand. So what we can do then, if it's time to step into another um, archetypal space, is to do a little ritual around the victim archetype and say, okay, thank you for being what I needed you to be at that time in my life, but it's time for me to let you go. Okay, and then if you can ritualize that, that will actually help you make the transition into an archetype that's going to better support you going forward into the future. But I, I really do believe in showing gratitude for these things. They show up for a reason. And it helps us to understand why they did to, in order to leave them behind when the time has come up. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, all of this stuff is very fascinating and I do know Carolyn miss, I actually stumbled upon the idea of archetypes through mm -hmm. watching her videos on YouTube. And I was like, Oh, what yeah. is this? You know, I mean, I know the general, I, I got the general gist of archetypes, but I've never I had never okay. seen someone kind of break it down that way and how it kind of affects us and influences our lives. Mm -hmm. So very, very important work there. So I, I kind of want to now talk about the right-hand path versus the left-hand path, with I, which I think- Okay, kind of... uh, if, if you don't mind, there's one thing that I would like to mention. This is not yes. something that I've ever spoken about publicly. I've been writing about this recently, but I did want to kind of introduce this a little bit. Um, and this is this is going into, into my next book, and I'm really excited about it, and this is about the archetypes, so I want to share it with you. And this is the idea of what I call archetypal intoxication. It is possible to go too far, right? It is possible to become so identified with one particular archetype that it completely overtakes your life. And there is a guy who was, um, he was the student of, of Carl Jung, his name is James Hillman, he, was, he created this thing called archetypal psychology, and he talked about this in a very specific and narrow way around the archetype of the god Hermes. So the way that he saw it was if you are experiencing hermetic intoxication, you are completely caught up in the digital world. Maybe this is like internet addiction, right? Like you are so entranced with what you see inside of your computer or inside of your phone that you've completely lost track and you need to like go touch grass or whatever, right? So, so that's, that's a very specific kind of intoxication. But I do think that, and this is my own personal work, is... This is a very broad thing. And when we talk about archetypes shifting and changing all the time, you are in fact constellating a version of an archetype that is entirely new to you, but you can become intoxicated with this version of who you were before. And sometimes the comfort of all of that power hanging around you can be intoxicating and it's, it becomes addictive and you want to hang on to it. So recognizing that it is possible to become intoxicated by archetypes and hold on to them for too long is a point that I wanted to make sure I got into today with our conversation. But this is, again, new work for me. So so just recognize that this is something that can happen. And then we'll talk about the left-hand path, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so. no, even before you get there, I, uh, I think that was a good thing to, to point out because I also kind of, I think it's important to highlight and let me know if you agree with me, is that obviously we're talking about these things and there are moments where we have to pause and kind of take inventory of our life and kind of understand where we are, what archetypes we're embodying. But it's not like something, and let me know if you agree, where we have to go through our day thinking about like, oh, am I the archetype of this right now? Am I embodying sure. this? You, I think your life unfolds and you fall into the archetype or archetypes that mm -hmm. match the frequency or the story that you're currently living out, if that makes any sense. But yeah, yeah. just wanted to well, kind and I, you know, we that. talk about that, that getting stuck word, right? Like this yeah. is a way to get stuck, right? You can get too attached to 
Yeah, I mean, and this is true too. Like if you think about people that are standing or having parasocial relationships with celebrities, they can get caught in that archetypal intoxication, right? If your mm -hmm. life is completely taken over by your devotion to a celebrity, you're in an archetypal intoxication situation, right? And this does happen to people, right? It becomes easier to identify with that big archetype than it is to try to manage the heroic aspects of our own lives. So, so it's just another concept to be in our, in our little toolbox of how we manage these moments. Like if you're finding yourself really wanting to stay with something, you need to do some work there and say, is this because this is a comfort? Is this because this is where I feel safe? Is this is because of what I've always done in the past and I want to keep doing this thing? Um, my, my husband and I have this kind of running joke. Um, and you're probably too, too young to remember this, but when I was a kid, my dad used to watch this show called The Wide World of Sports. It was on ABC. And at the beginning of the show, it would say the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, right? And it just became the, like we're Gen Xers, right? <laughs> Got stuck in our heads from when we were kids. But we twisted a little bit. And now we make jokes about the agony of victory all the time, right? So we say, okay, I got my workout in today. Now I'm sore and I'm experiencing the agony of victory because I did the hard thing that I needed to do that was an opportunity for growth instead of staying in the place that I've always been before that was comfortable and easy for me and familiar. So think about that for a minute. Like, okay, we are creatures that are sort of designed to seek comfort and seek ease and seek the like easiest path to anything. And what this work kind of is suggesting is to say, and, and again, these myths are 10,000 years old or more, right? Like the growth that you are needing is only going to come from a little bit of struggle. And I'm not trying to conflate trauma, like true trauma and struggle. There's a, the amount of struggle that's appropriate for growth. And then there's the amount of struggle that's not appropriate for growth and is actually going to be damaging to you. And I want to make sure we're, we understand that we're not talking about the same thing. If I went out and I ran 25 miles tomorrow, it would not be an opportunity for growth for me, right? It would be something that would put me in the hospital probably. So we're talking about different things, right? If I go out and I run a few laps at our, you know, our local uh, uh, track, that would probably be a good thing for me. But if I tried to run hundred miles, it's not so good, right? <laughs> so, so think about it that way, right? Like, okay, what can I do that's gonna encourage growth through a little bit of struggle and, and, I, and I like that exercise analogy because we, you know, we, you know, I always said the tendency to want to go too far and I had to learn how to maximize the amount of growth I was getting through doing the right amount. So, so thinking about having to kind of seek that agony of victory a little bit can be extremely helpful. Okay. Thank left you. hand path. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Left hand path. So, okay. That, that was great. Thank you for kind of explaining that. And I think that's a great way to kind of wrap up what we were talking about regarding archetypes. So I want to talk about the left-hand path versus the right-hand path, which I think kind of, again, ties into everything we've been talking about, the hero journey, making yeah. choices, coming to a crossroads and kind of navigating all of that. Well, you know, we have so many beautiful examples of this in, in our storytelling, in our myths. Um, it's, it's this idea that um, the, the way I like to talk about it is this, okay. So I get a lot of my inspiration from ancient Greek mythology and the ancient Greek language had two words for time. And the first word is a word that we can still recognize in our language and that is the Kronos. Now Kronos is a character, he's he he his father, he's from Greek mythology. He, um, he's also the guy we see on New Year's Eve, the old man with the diaper and the scythe holding, that is Kronos. And the word chronos as a word for time is actually describing what I would call regular everyday life kind of time. Like we go to the bank or we do the dishes or, you know, we just kind of live in the grind of life. And, you know, I, I work with this idea a lot where we're in the myth of Sisyphus, like we have to roll the rock up the hill over and over again. And, you know, we have our moment where we, we're done the rolling and we kind of feel the breeze on our face and then the rock rolls back down and we have to do the dishes again and do the laundry again and go to work again. And, you know, just the same, 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 right? Like this is chronos time. But we also have a second word for time. And, you know, you get that word chronos and like chronometer, you know, this is, it still exists in our language. It's like a kind of time piece, like a way to measure time. We have another word for, for time in ancient Greek. And this word is kairos. It's spelled K-A-I-R-O-S. And what that is describing is sacred time, the time that you are in the temple and worshiping and you have, so, this is when we lose track of time, you know, like it feels like five minutes have passed, but it's really been four hours or whatever. I had a little, little moment of this, my first date with my husband, it was like this, we had this, we met each other, we spent 10 hours together on our first date and from then on we were a couple and that was just the way that it was, it was this magical moment in my life. 
And we have those, right? Sometimes it's playing with your child. Sometimes it's going on a hike. Sometimes you're in a museum and you're standing in front of a painting and you have no idea how long you've been standing there because it moved you so much. It's capturing awe, it's capturing gratitude, and it's capturing the sacred. And these are the moments, you know, I've talked before about the other world being on the side, the other side of a very thin curtain. This is, these are the moments that we're touching that, right? You are in fact touching the world of the gods or you are pulling that God energy into your world. Like you are right there on, in that liminal space between one state of being and another. There's another word that we use called flow. This comes from Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, he's a, he's a Czech psychologist. He talks about like athletics in, in sports, right? Like if you know that you are gonna perform admirably well, perfectly, you are in a state, what they call a state of flow, right? So you are, you're gonna do it because everything is lining up properly for you. And in fact, the word kairos, the original meaning of it, it was describing the sense of the bow being held taut by the archer and you're about to release the arrow and you know that it's gonna strike true because everything, every atom of the universe is lining up perfectly for you. Okay, so this is a really powerful concept, right? So this is essentially what the left-hand path is. You are in fact pushing your energy toward doing the thing that's outside the realm of what regular human life is, okay? Now, there is a place for the right-hand path. The right-hand path is getting through all of the stuff that is required of our day-to-day -day lives. Like, and this is, I think often, and I talked about this in my book, right? Like this is the first half of life is dominated by the right-hand path. Often you are focused on, what are, you, what are you looking for when you're young, right? You're looking for a relationship, you're looking for a house, you're looking for a job, a career, you, maybe you're looking for having children, you may have a, some kind of bucket list things you want to do. Oh, I always wanted to hike the Inca Trail or, you know, whatever it is. Like there's something that you, there are things you want to do. But then eventually you start to realize that you're called toward the sacred. And that is when people often will step off of that right-hand path of pursuing all of those things that are keeping us kind of anchored into regular human life and seeking the sacred, right? So, and this is expressed over and over and over again in mythology. Like this is a thing that happens to humans. In, in India, they talk about this a lot. You have stages of human life in, in the Hindu tradition. And you, you start out as a youth and then you're a householder and you're running your household and that's all right-hand path stuff. But then you get to this moment in midlife and all of a sudden you're not feeling so called by all of those things that mattered so much to you when you were younger and you're feeling called to the sacred. And this is when, like, I don't know if you ever read the book Eat, Pray, Love, but this is a perfect example of people stepping onto the left, as someone stepping onto the left-hand path. She had done all the things. She got the house, she got the husband, she got the money, she got the career, everything. And it's not satisfying her because it doesn't, it can't. It can for a little while. But then eventually you start to realize that there is something much greater that is waiting for you on the far side. And you have spiritual work that must be done. So we, we recognize that there is this stepping onto the left-hand path, right? And I see people at this moment a lot because when they start to ask those kind of questions and they say, this is not everything that I want, I know that I'm being called to something much deeper and more profound. And this can be done a lot of different ways. And, and I often do help people, help guide people off of the right-hand path and onto the left-hand path. Like, how are you gonna navigate that? And what I, I work a lot with creatives, right? Like, so we talk about lessons from mythology to inspire creative work. And we talk a lot about the left-hand path because what you're trying to do as an artist, if you are creating art, you are pulling from that Kairos energy, right? And I, I'm a writer too. You know, I, I do my own creative work. I also write fiction. So what I do, and I would invite anybody to try this, right? Is I do my my Kronos time stuff. Like if I have to do dishes or you know whatever, take care of that, and I'm going to sit down and do my writing. So what I do is I ritualize that experience, and I sit down and I have a prayer and I have a moment of meditation. And like this novel that I've been writing, it's um, the goddess kind of like Aphrodite is sort of at the center of it. So I will literally sit down and do a meditation and a prayer with Aphrodite and invite her into my space, open up that Cairo space. And then I will, I, that opens the ritualized temple, imaginary temple of where I'm doing my creative work. And I do the work for however long I'm going to do it. And then I close the space and I show gratitude for that, for whoever has shown up and for whatever creative work has shown up. And then I close the space ritualistically. And then that allows me to go back into my Kronos time again. So we all have times of Kronos and times of Kairos, right? Now, maybe you are stuck. I, I see people that are actually stuck in Kairos. They cannot function in regular life. 
they can't. Or they, I mean, I, I see people all the time and they're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm reading my tarot, but I, I can't, I'm living in my car because, because I, you know, I can't, you know, figure out the, the, the money is a part of life, right? This is a part of life that involves chronos, right? You have to be able to successfully navigate back and forth between those two states of being. And it can be really challenging in both directions. Sometimes people get stuck in one and sometimes people get stuck in the other side. So. Okay. So what I'm understanding is that the right hand path and left hand path work together, right? And it's about balancing both of them my understanding from the past with the right versus the left is kind of like a fork in the road type of situation where it's like do you go left or do you go right but how you're kind of describing it is less about do you go left and stay left do you go right and stay right it's about knowing how to kind of move through both paths and like the the right hand side is the stuff that you're supposed to do the practical stuff and then the left hand side is the less practical more creative side of things right which kind of it kind of reminds me of the our right brain versus our left brain mm -hmm. right and I think if I'm understanding right I think the right brain is actually the more creative side yeah, that's exactly, because it switched. It's it's switched. it's switched yeah. and the left brain is more yeah. of the practical side and the idea is that we need to incorporate both we live in a world where it promotes the left brain function and kind right. of you know does not celebrate the right brain function but as human beings we need to be able to move through both sides right especially you know the left side helps us with this physical reality the right side helps us with our more spiritual path that's connected to this higher uh source right um, so that's very interesting. I, I actually thought you were going to say it's like it's about choosing a particular path, but you're talking about being able to intertwine both of I, them. I, think, I, guess. I do. I, yeah. I mean, I think that you're going to need to be able to navigate crossing back and forth all the time because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want people to be stuck in Kronos time and never have a spark of awe or joy or the sacred in their lives. And sometimes people really struggle with that. They are stuck on that in that Kronos time on that right hand path. But I also don't want people to be on the other side because it, it is. Yeah, you know, I, I would. I think this would resonate for some of your listeners, right? If you are very drawn to the spiritual life, you this may be a struggle for you. But I also want you to take care of your physical body, right? Like I want you to be in a place that is safe, where you have a good place to live, and you have food to eat, and you have all the things that you need to take care of your physical movement through the world. And I do think I see this sometimes. Like people are so attached to the spiritual life that they're trying to like hurry up their way through Chronos. And, and they're not like, it's like they're not anchored enough into the world. We need to have our, and I do this actually, I literally do this with people in workshops. I, I work with a lot of people in the yoga community and a lot of them are very focused on kind of this air energy and this spiritual energy that Jesus pushed upward. And I will make them get their toes like, like dug up into mother earth, right? They're so non-anchored to the world because all they want to do is do this because it's amazing. Being in Kairos is amazing. But sometimes we need to like find our way to anchor ourselves down into this being heart of Mother Earth, right? And it gets that gets lost sometimes. So, you know, what if what I'm saying is resonating for you, anybody that's listening, and you know, if you struggle with this, like I, I want to introduce another concept here. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm sorry to keep doing this to you, but no, I please. Say, I love that yeah. I love that you're introducing all these new concepts. No. I love it. So so when we talk about this, there's this wonderful word. And I actually I have a a retreat coming up in Spain that's entirely themed around this particular idea. We have this word from that comes out of Romani culture in Spain, and it's this word is duende. Have you heard this word before at all? Uh, duende. And so the original idea of what duende was was that it was this kind of little house gnome that was kind of dark and dirty that lived in the house. But there's this poet named Federico Garcia Yorca, and he did an essay about duende and the kind of this concept of it through the Romani people, and it comes out of the flamenco world. So the idea is that, you know, we were used to, in the West, we're used to thinking of inspiration and all of these kind of sacred ideas kind of coming down to us from above, as if the sacred is above us, and it's gonna descend down onto our heads. Like we see, oh, there's so much in Western iconography about this, like Jesus or God, or, you know, whatever spiritual thing that you are getting inspiration from is going to come down and like hit you in the top of the head, right? So it's coming down like this. Well, Duende kind of switches that idea. And what Duende is describing is the idea that, I like, think of the Romani people in Spain, they were abused and probably still are being abused for centuries. 
And what they recognized is all of their blood and their tears and their pain and their trauma was going down from them and soaking into the earth. And what Duende is capturing is the idea that we are gonna take this pain and all of this trauma and all of this blood and all of this horror that we've dealt with, and we're gonna pull that energy back up from below from where all of this is soaked down into the earth. We're gonna pull it up through the soles of our feet and we're gonna transmute it into art. If you go and see a flamenco performance, this is what you're seeing, right? I, I went to this show in Spain a few years ago, right? I, it was just some little tourist thing. Flam oh, come see flamenco dancing. I'm like, oh, I'm telling my husband, oh, it's going to be silly. It's not going to be real. It's for tourists. It's going to be ridiculous. And I said, if I start crying within 30 seconds, you'll know it's the real deal. And it was like so instant. It was like, Phew. yeah. <laughs> they start, so they have the guitar, and they have the singer, and they have the dancers. And what they're doing is, and this is where Flamenco comes up out of this idea, right? Is that we're gonna take all of the pain that we've ever experienced, we're gonna transmute it into something that is now beautiful. And to me, this is the most sacred thing that a human being can do. And you can, and this is what I'm talking, I've been talking about this whole time, right? You're gonna take all of your pain and you're gonna transmute it in your heroic journey into something that is now a treasure both for you and for other people. And that's what Duende is capturing in its essence, is whatever it is that we had to do. I mean, human life is painful. I don't care how rich or famous or beautiful you are, you're going to have pain in your life. And if we can take that pain, and if we can do more than just survive it, if we can be transformed by it, then you are doing that thing that we talked about earlier in our conversation, where now it is something that has been changed and is going to be something that helps somebody else and helps us through the process of going through this alchemical process itself. I love that so much. Um, <laughs> I, and I, and I, and I resonate with that so much because I think pain, the pain that we feel throughout our life, right. I think allows, gives us opportunities to transmute that energy for something mm -hmm. good and greater, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us, for our community. You know, it's, nobody wants to feel pain, but I think pain is just such a transformative energy if you transmute yeah. it properly. So I think that's Absolutely. what you're kind of talking about yeah. in that story. So that's what I've been saying this whole time. Yeah, yes, exactly. That's <laughs> what, we, yeah, that's exactly what we've been talking about this whole time. I have to ask you before we start kind of closing out and winding mm -hmm. down towards the end of the show, What's your favorite myth and, and why is it your favorite myth, if you have one? Well, okay. So that's, you know, that's like asking me what my favorite book is, but I, I know, I know. I'm sure like <laughs> you have like a hundred in your head that you can think of. Yeah. So, so I, I actually, so in a more general sense, what I really like is I like to look at stories of women from myths, especially women that were clearly misunderstood and misrepresented. Like I'm fascinated by the character of Medea because she has gone down in history as a child killer, killing her own children. There's so much more going on in that story because what it's conveniently forgotten by everybody that calls Medea a woman who killed her own children, which she did do, but also what gets left out is that she was a witch. <laughs> she was a direct descendant of the goddess Hecate, who was the goddess of witches, and she had potions that could bring them back to life. And that's exactly what she did. She killed them. So if you're not familiar with Medea, she was. She met a guy named Jason, and he was. He had this ship called the Argo, and they were going around having adventures with all these Greek heroes and, and heroines. There were women on the boat too, and they go to this country called Colchis, which is now part of the country of Georgia. Um, so they sail to Georgia, and they want to kill this uh, fleece. Uh, they want to get this golden fleece that the king of Colchis owns. Right? He has this ram that has golden fleece, and he. Jason wants to be the king and he's told, you know, it's like the fairy tales, like, oh, I'm going to give you a job and I'm going to give you another job because I don't really want you to come back and be the king. But if I keep giving you jobs, you keep going away and maybe you'll be killed <laughs> and I'll be get to get to be the king. But in this case, they went after the golden fleece and he meets Medea. She is the daughter of the king of cultures and she, they are all witches. They are all descended from Hecate and she, he cannot do what he has to do without her guidance. She, he will not survive this if she doesn't help him. And this is kind of a metaphor for how women's intuition is important when you come at it from like a very masculine kind of power dominant, I'm just gonna hack at things until I win kind of approach. <laughs> anyway, so she teaches him what to do. He is, they escape together. He takes her away, he takes her back to his home. And now she is an immigrant and she has no legal rights. She's living in this city where with her husband where she has absolutely no rights and she's gonna be on the street if she's not married to him. And he's still trying to become king. So he tries to leave her. He leaves her for a princess so that he can become the king. And she kills their children. And that's kind of how she goes down in history. 
but and, and there's more to their story too and she ends up marrying other people later it's like a whole big thing but i love taking this classic villain from greek mythology and turning that story right because there's a lot of power for women in a story like this if we can get past this oh my god she's killed her children because what i mean we were acting like this is the most horrible thing that a woman can do is to reject the aspect of their selves as motherhood right so i i love and, and there, this happens over and over, right, in this, right? You, you see something that on the face of it looks terrible or, or whatever, and, but if you drill down just a little bit, you start to get at some really interesting stuff and things that are really helpful psychologically once you start to unpack that. So I love the, the, um, the story of Ariadne from, from Crete. That story is very, very complex. Starts out with a Minotaur. She's the sister of the Minotaur. Ends up with her being abandoned by Theseus and actually marrying the god Dionysus. And there are really interesting, interesting things going on with that as well. Um, and you know, we can talk about Dionysus. And there's a whole big thing about Dionysus. But you know, he's a, he's the god of ecstasy. And she left behind her right hand path life, being married to the king of Athens, and embraced the ecstatic experience. And that's exactly what we were just talking about, right? So. And he's the only one of the Greek gods of the entire pantheon that gets married and stays loyal to his wife. The only one. <laughs> so I love that too. So that's, you know, there's just really interesting things metaphorically to understand about um, what it's like to navigate a human life, especially for women in that particular story as well. So that's only two. I, I think I did really well. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. And I have to go and actually like read those stories because they do sound very mm -hmm. fascinating um because we have to remember a lot of times these stories are a metaphor for larger concepts larger themes in life and society as well that we need to pay attention to on a macro and micro level as well and mm -hmm. i think you also said something else that kind of ties back into the left hand and right hand thing that i i think we kind of missed a little bit it's like in our day-to-day -day, we we have to learn how to balance both but i think sometimes the the left hand path which is not the right hand path, which is what you're supposed to do. The left hand path is you daring to live the life that you want to live and follow your bliss. And mm -hmm. I think that was something else too, that you kind of just touched on a little bit in the story that you just uh, shared. Um, well, okay. I, I tell you one more thing, since you said the phrase, follow your bliss, I have to share this with you. Yes. Uh, you know, getting back to it. So this is a phrase that was made famous by Joseph Campbell, who we talked about earlier on. And, you know, I, I had never met Campbell myself. He died when I was 17. I wasn't reading him then, but I, I have a lot of friends that knew him well when he was alive. And one thing that I learned from that is that he, when it became so popular back in the 70s, that phrase, follow your bliss, he was worried because he thought, everybody thought it meant just being happy all the time. And that's not what it is. He's like, I should have said, follow your blisters. Because what it really means is doing the thing that's hard work for you, but is the thing that you must do in this world. So if you're going to follow your bliss, you have to follow your blisters too. Mm, beautifully well said um thank you so much Allison I have to ask you because I asked all my guests have you shifted in perspective on anything recently and it could be as lighthearted or as deep as you want it to be well I will tell you that recently I I had some health issues and I was feeling very stuck in that moment uh I felt more dead than alive and I did have a giant shift I actually um I went to India and when I, I felt that I needed to, and we haven't even talked about the goddess Kali, she's the creator and the destroyer. She's an incredibly powerful figure in Hindu religion. And I went to her temple in Varanasi and it absolutely shifted everything for me to actually be face to face with this particular goddess. And like something about being outside of what was familiar and known for me, India was really challenging for me. It's very crowded there. It was, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit crowd phobic and it was just really, uh, and I was, I stuck out like a sore thumb because I was so much taller than everybody else because I'm almost six feet tall. And it was a really strange and disconcerting experience for me to be in this culture that's so different than what I'm used to. But the fact that it was so different was what allowed me to make that shift that I needed to make. It challenged me in so many different ways and got me out of what was comfortable for me that I was able to actually end the moment of death that I had been in for so long, feeling like I was mostly dead, having survived this illness, and it allowed me to start living again. And I, and it was a, a way for me to like do the kind of work that I do, and actually go to a place that really helped me figure out how to make that shift. So that's I would say the most recent one. Well, I'm so happy that you were able to have that experience and come out yeah. on the other side feeling much better and rebirthed and more alive. So that's amazing. 
So where can people find you? And I know that you have a recent book that I don't know if it's been released yet. Finding and following. No, it hasn't, your path no, it hasn't yet. So, okay. so I would say, um, let me just tell you, my website is called mythic stories, mythicstories.com. You can also, you know, my name is Allison Steger. Um, you can find me. There's, you, know, you can follow me on social media if you want. There's a lot of information available there. I have classes that are about to come out. I have um, an individual coaching that I do. I have retreats coming up. And then in a little bit longer, the, the book will be out too. And I will be sure to share that on mythicstories.com as soon as the information about that is available. But if anybody that's listening wants to talk to me, I love having these kind of conversations. And if you can sign up for a, a discovery call with me for free. And you know, if you've got something that you're struggling with, I can give you a little bit of guidance about that. And I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Having conversations like this make me feel so happy to be doing this work. And I really appreciate your time and the wisdom that you imparted uh, to my listeners. So thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Happy to be here. It was really fun. Thank you.